Um, if you're a creative working in AAA, which I did for many, many years, um, put this stuff up to your higher ups. And if they don't see the value in what you're asking for when you ask for consultants, when you ask for research, go have a coffee with your marketing team and just terrify them. She's a black Anita Serkis. Over the past few weeks, I heard a specific company be talked about over and over again. Sweet Baby Inc. I didn't know who they were, what they did, or why people talked about them so much. All I knew was that they were quite unpopular at the moment, and frankly, observing everything from afar, a slight dislike for a company I didn't even know did build up. Fast forward to today, and I have a slightly more complete view. Lots of people band together on Steam to catalog all the games Sweet Baby Inc. worked on, games magazines made a big stink about the situation, and self-proclaimed Sweet Baby employees stood true to their namesake and embarrassed themselves online. But why is all of this going on in the first place? And more importantly, what warrants this adversarial back and forth? First off, we need to understand what kind of company Sweet Baby actually is. Sweet Baby Inc. is a game consultation and writing firm that is hired in order to provide feedback, conduct risk assessment on a project, handle the copywriting for advertisement, or might even write an entire script for a game. Their services are pretty much entirely bound to writing and consultation, and they state on their website that they value some things especially highly. Inclusion and representation. Really, Sweet Baby is an outsourcing company, of which many exist and are utilized throughout the industry. Some do concept art, others even program components for a game, even others specialize in VFX, and Sweet Baby happen to write and consult about stuff. Where the perceived problems with the company come into play is when it comes to the beliefs that are associated with them. Eventually, a multitude of people online picked up on Sweet Baby Inc. and the Steam Creator page cataloging their games, posting clips, reporting the news surrounding the company, and also providing a platform to the boycotters standing against what Sweet Baby is all about, rejecting predominantly progressive messaging built into experiences Sweet Baby was in some way involved in, and adamantly protesting against the perceived ideological pressure in the industry. So. How did this whole hullabaloo between the protesters and the Sweet Baby employees really kick off? Well, it started off with a Brazilian gamer who goes by Cabrutos. In an interview, Cabrutos mentioned feeling that games had started to change since his childhood. Getting wind of SBI in around 2022, he singled out the release of Suicide Squad Kill the Justice League, a game that SBI contributed to, that had received widespread negative reviews. Informing SBI Detected, Cabrutos took inspiration from the Denuvo Games Steam Group, a community forum to list out games that used the DRM software Denuvo, which has been blamed for causing various technical problems, encouraging users to stay away from games that use it. Cabrutos got the same idea to form a similar group to discourage people from buying the game Sweet Baby was involved in. Just as the Denuvo group hoped to root out the technical issues that software was causing, Cabrutos was hoping to root out the social attitudes he saw as being inserted into games by Sweet Baby. These attitudes being performative wokeism, censorship and ideological pressure. He also saw the company as disrespecting the source material of projects they worked on. The Suicide Squad game giving Batman a death when he was unceremoniously shot in the head, instead of something heroic, a scene that angered many after being leaked before the game's launch, was an example of this that came to mind. Others being the choice to present Poison Ivy as a child instead of how she's usually shown, in other mediums, an adult, often also a sexualized woman, or to disrespect another DC hero, The Flash, by showing one of the squad pissing on his corpse after he gets knocked off to the afterlife. The Boy God community got a massive boost after certain SBI employees tried to instigate a harassment campaign against the group, encouraging their followers to mass report the group and Cabrutos personally to Valve, hoping that they would get banned from the Steam platform. 
This backfired massively. As commentators picked up on the story, masses of people joined up to the group and began to speak against Sweet Baby. Valve confirmed the group and its founder were going nowhere, the employees and Sweet Baby ended up having to private their accounts instead to avoid the backlash, and the main instigator of the harassment ended up getting suspended by Twitter for breaking the rules. It was a textbook example of the Streisand effect. Rather than criticism towards SBI being silenced, many gaming circles, especially with a conservative leaning, became aware of the company and their questionable practices. Everyone had something to say on the issue already. Asmongold took a break from stealing content to comment on Kim Belair, the CEO of Sweet Baby Inc. Go have a coffee with your marketing team and just terrify them with the possibility of what's going to happen if they don't give you what you want. Um, right. And so let me explain really what that terror is. Five tweets that go viral and then nobody actually cares after that. Between leeching off of video essays on the subject, of course. A Gundam cosplayer and online opinion haver covering the Sweet Baby drama brought up many insightful points in his coverage. Basically, when they say that, like uh, you bring them something, they look it over, and then some person who isn't qualified to flip fries for you tells you if they find it offensive somehow. This wording could be triggering for some people who suffer from the trauma of being told no. Type of energy. And the likes such as Hirohe doing extensive Twitter research or rather turning on OBS and reading out Twitter headlines for 10 minutes. Similarly to Kotaku, PC Gamer just released an article attempting to run defense for Sweet Baby Inc. It's very interesting how these corpos stick together from saying, this is profound misinformation and gaslighting. Sweet Baby Inc. employees attempted to try to cancel culture, harass, and brigade a gamer in order to take away his Steam account and his games. It was so bad Twitter locked the SBI accounts that did this. All Detected did was make a list of games credited to Sweet Baby Inc., something on their own website. Well, within Steam's TOS, something your article gets wrong again. Mm. And speaking of OBS, the quartering is good at that. His entire online career consists of pressing a button, waffling without much direction, and then pressing it again to end the recording. <laughs> of all the videos I've seen on the matter, the opinion piece from some ordinary gamers I think was the best of a bunch, offering a more nuanced perspective on the matter. See, the whole idea, and I, I, the whole idea isn't about like, oh, let's make that character, uh, uh, let's make that, uh, let's make that a uh, character like a different race or something. Uh, I think the idea was that she was trying to counter the person that was going like, bro, but they're French. French people are just supposed to be whites anyways, right? Especially in like 2024, it's also another melting pot society. There's French people that look like me. They t they talk in French, but they look like me. I think I think what she should be hammering is if you want to talk about good fucking writing probably don't write a stereotypical French character that would be out of Looney Tunes back in the day, okay? With the beret and the cigar in their mouth. Dog, Nostalgia Critic made this joke over a decade ago. To sum this all up, everyone had something to say. Some of it interesting, much more of the opinions, however, having an ideological bent to them. Ironically, the narrative around Sweet Baby Inc. revolves around a multitude of clips originating from the CEO of the company, Kim Belair. Tweets and comments made from various confirmed or self-proclaimed employees of the company, which are less than flattering, and from articles that covered the story culminating in the following interpretation of what Sweet Baby are and do. Sweet Baby Inc is a woke propaganda company which forces itself into collaborations with game studios through instrumenting developers to scare higher-ups in order to get contracted by studios and to subsequently inject progressive ideas into the games that they get to work on. And they make women ugly. Off the media used to paint that unfavorable image of Sweet Baby Inc., one clip comes up again and again. A call to action from the CEO of Sweet Baby Inc instructing developers to terrify marketing people within their companies. Um, if you're a creative working in AAA, which I did for many, many years, um, put this stuff up to your higher-ups, and if they don't see the value in what you're asking for when you ask for consultants, when you ask for research, go have a coffee with your marketing team and just terrify them with the possibility of what's gonna happen if they don't give you what you want. This clip you just saw, everyone took and ran with the story. Essentially, they sell their services as like, hey, do you want to make your video game woke? Hire us. 
That's essentially, you know, that's essentially what they do. Is they, they work, they basically bully people into it. Another clip which is less used but still often referenced is one of Kim comparing the main demographic of players, white males, to picky babies. We still look at our core demographics and say, okay, they're white, cis, hetero males. And we cater almost exclusively to them. And the problem is that we don't just cater to them like, you know, here, here's something that we think you'll enjoy. We cater them the way that we cater to like a picky baby. From the way the critics talk about Sweet Baby, one could easily get a sense that something sinister is going on here. Sweet Baby employees tried to silence the naysayers after all. Something didn't feel right, however, and we felt that there was a little more to the story. When we researched Sweet Baby further, we found that the company has been massively misrepresented and that many of the figures encouraging the boycott either don't know what they're talking about or are knowingly misleading people. Maybe SBI's agenda isn't anywhere near as scary as it has been presented to be. Let us bring up the Suicide Squad example again. Sweet Baby Incorporated has essentially been dumped with all of the blame for the unpopular story elements in the game. Cabrutos pointed to it as the main reason for him starting a boycott and he claimed that the group was, probably, behind these unpopular twists. I mean, let's take Suicide Squad for example. I think that game would have tanked uh, even if SBI didn't get involved with it. I mean, it, it wouldn't do well because it simply is not a good game, at least not in my opinion. But uh, since SBI got involved, so probably it, it was probably them who made the decision to kill Batman the way they did and to uh, make Poison Ivy a child and, and someone pissing on. Like, that was too um, much. Yeah, the pistol. Yeah, 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 that yeah, was too much. Or Flash's body, if I'm not mistaken, yes. right? In his defense, he did say that these changes only worsened the game that was already poor in quality because of its gameplay problems. But he still implied that it was SBI's influence that ruined the story. This is a message that was picked up among those supporting the boycott with some accusing SBI of writing the entire plot. The fact that the game is totally and visually nothing like its predecessors, the Batman Arkham games, made this an easy assumption to take on. SBI had strong-armed their way into the development and poisoned the well. When we looked into SBI's role though, a very different picture quickly emerged. Kim Belair responded to the commentary about Suicide Squad in an interview by denying that the company had been involved with writing the plot, saying that instead, Sweet Baby's role was working on more background narrative design, things like ads in the game world, audio logs, and NPC dialogue. Now, maybe you might say that this is just damage control and the company is trying to get off the hook for the game's failures by throwing its developer Rocksteady under the bus. But an ex-Rocksteady employee who worked on the game as well came out on social media to confirm Kim's version of events, pointing out that the story had been written by the same people who worked on the stories of Batman Arkham City and Arkham Knight, Sefton Hill and Ian Ball, and that the story had been ironed out way before Sweet Baby even existed as a company. Other examples of this also came out as the controversy exploded. Another game that Sweet Baby had worked on was Alan Wake 2, one of its lead characters, police investigator Saga Anderson, was originally meant to be white and had been changed to be a black character because of SBI's influence. While Saga had been portrayed as white in the teaser for the game, its director Cal Rowley bluntly said that the claims SBI were responsible for her being black in the final product were not true. Although SBI did have an influence on Saga's character development, they weren't the only ones, with her actress Melanie Libert also being consulted. Ultimately, Remedy were at the helm and their leads took credit for the character. Why the character initially appeared as white could be for any number of reasons. Maybe they simply hadn't cast the actor yet, and when they found Melanie, they decided that she was the perfect fit. These sorts of changes can happen in development and it doesn't have to be for any sinister or ideological reasons. In fact, this isn't the first time a change like this has been made in a Remedy game. In the game Control, the character Fred Langston was originally depicted as black in the concept art. 
In the final game, he's a white man. Another example of these race swaps we could point to is a major character from Fallout New Vegas, NCR Ambassador Dennis Crocker. Crocker was originally envisioned as a white character, but because of a mix-up in the recording sessions, the voice actor for the black male characters, Emerson Brooks, ended up reading the lines. Obsidian decided to just roll with it, and Crocker became black. Writing isn't anything static. It evolves over time, and sometimes early ideas of what a character should be are changed later with the finished versions looking little or nothing like the original pitch. Sometimes that's because of purposeful choices, and other times it can come from a developer just rolling with what circumstances dropped on their lap. The problem with all this is unless you have inside knowledge, it is hard to know exactly what dialogue in the game has been worked on in-house and what was worked on by outside contractors. All that Cabrutos and his group actually identify is if SBI have worked on any game in any capacity. But what that process actually looks like is a very open-ended question. Some games they've worked on have been entirely written by them, while for other projects the company's role is very minute. This ambiguity has been used by critics of SBI as a license to blame them for all sorts of problems because the claims are unfalsifiable. Who can know if it's true or not? So much for innocent until proven guilty. But that's the thing, we actually do know in the few examples we have where SBI has been blamed by critics for a specific complaint, like Saga's skin color or Suicide Squad storyline, the critics have been wrong. The company has essentially been made into a scapegoat for the vibes critics are unhappy with, while these groups of people who are so sure that they can just tell, actually can't. Even Cabrutos would agree that SBI was scapegoated to some degree. That's what I would say too, is like, I really yeah. don't, I don't think that they're the only ones that are doing this. And I, I do think like personally, I mm -hmm. think in a way, like they're kind of like a representation of the problem that everybody knows about, but they're also kind of being scapegoated, I think, because the odds are that there's a lot of other companies and people that work at the companies that effectively do the same thing. It's just that we don't have their names, we don't know who they are. So this is the one instance in which people actually do know who it is. So all of the frustration is being put, I would say disproportionately, on Sweet mm -hmm. Baby. But in a way, it's like people aren't even really criticizing Sweet Baby or getting mad about that. It's just that it's effectively kind of what they represent. Is that right? Yeah, exactly. I mean, yeah. of course, they are the main target here because mm -hmm. they were the first ones to come out and say, hey, we are Super Pink and we do this kind of work. Take a look at our website. Take a look at our portfolio. We yeah. are working on these games. This is what we are doing. And then people saw what we are doing. Then people realized, oh, so it is because of them that those kind of stuff in, I know, let's say, for example, in Spider-Man 2 are happening. But it's not just the company's involvement in certain projects that has been distorted. It turns out that the entire MO of the company has been badly mischaracterized by their critics. Let us bring up that clip from earlier again. While a majority of commentators online stuck to this clip from Twitter, which can be easily seen by how the clip was bit crushed further and further the more it was reposted, or had been uncharacteristically low quality when compared to the original when used in new style videos, some claimed to have gone the extra mile and seemed to have watched the entire presentation. She plugs her GDC representation panel from 2022. So I checked it out. This donut right here eventually admitted in a follow-up video that he stopped watching the presentation after a mention of Catcher in the Rye which is mere minutes into the talk. This time people finally caught on to Kim Valera's 2019 CGC panel that I showed in my first video 10 days ago. I skipped the rest of this video as soon as she went into her trademark rant about Catcher in the Rye. And in the end seriously suggested to hold any form of integrity in covering this story. Big YouTubers and streamers would shit out 10 minute videos with cliff notes 
racking in fact checks for knowing next to nothing. And smaller YouTubers would post daily updates with Twitter screenshots, hoping to get noticed in the algorithm by hitting the SEO. And then there's me in the middle, trying to maintain some level of integrity. It's a Gundam. Shut the fuck up. Anyways, we decided to delve deeper and managed to find Kim Belair's full presentation at GDC, the Game Developers Conference, and decided to just give it a watch. Let us bring up the before shown 20 second clip of Kim Belair instructing developers to instill fear one last time. Um, if you're a creative working in AAA, which I did for many, many years, um, put this stuff up to your higher ups. And if they don't see the value in what you're asking for when you ask for consultants, when you ask for research, go have a coffee with your marketing team and just terrify them with the possibility of what's going to happen if they don't give you what you want. It does sound bad, doesn't it? However, when continuing her point... Because they have to consider, like, I, I say that a lot as a joke, but it's actually very, very true because if you start to consider the people who are player and audience facing and who have to deal with mitigating harm and with keeping the sentiment around their game and their project positive, there's like a genuine value that you could impress upon them with um, both ethically and financially. You could say this is important. And it's also a valid discussion to have because if you're working with a very thin narrative budget and you work in AAA, I think you'll be pleasantly surprised or dismayed by the amount of money that marketing can give you. Um, if you're not in AAA, and if you're indie, or if you're freelance, um, and you're building a budget because you still have to, and you're writing up a pitch, I would say that you should consider adding the necessary funds for representation into your scope as you would any other item. The context suddenly changes. But wait, this goes even further. Several minutes before the terrify them line is uttered, Kim reveals an important aspect of her character, even labeling it a fun fact. A pseudo fun fact about me, that's slightly fun, is that I actually have a marketing degree. And so I want to put on that like very mercenary hat for a second and talk about the way that we decide how we're going to sell the art that we make and how we're going to approach the audiences that we make it for. Because I think so often when people like us get told, you know, from higher ups or from society at large, this isn't what players want, it's not a conversation about demographic, sorry, content, it's a conversation about demographics. And I think that in our industry and in so many creative industries, if you want to look at film and television and any art form, we start treating our core demographics as a fixed and static value, something that does not want to change and something that is locked in place. And now what was spun as a slip of a mask, unveiling a shadowy cabal of puppet masters pulling all the strings behind the scenes, turned into a marketer communicating to a group of developers how they should approach and talk to marketer type people. The conspiracy theory presents Kim as instructing developers to threaten their higher-ups in order to get SBI contracted. However, what Kim was actually saying is that in order to get more funding from marketing, you gotta make a good point. And you gotta be convincing. Now when we look at how the clip was spread and what was omitted, it reframes how one looks at this boycott. Instead of seeing a group of gamers fed up with the enchantification of the medium they adore so much and finding who is responsible for it, we see a horde of ideologues influencing the masses by using fear tactics. Sweet Baby are going to make your protagonists weak, they will make female characters look ugly and they will inject propaganda into your games in service of political correctness. And by the way, the Jews may be behind this too. While even most boycotters would scratch their heads at the last one, we did see examples of people linking Sweet Baby to some form of anti-Semitic conspiracy without extraordinary evidence to boot. This 20 second clip did an inconceivable amount of damage. Everyone ran with it and so far we could find only one instance of a person on Twitter correcting the record in an attempt to put the clip into context. The very vast majority of reposts put words into Kim Belair's mouth, and some clips are worse than others. Take this Japanese tweet as an example, which translated what Kim said and sandwiched political correctness in parentheses somewhere into the translation. Political correctness didn't come up even once, 
during Kim Belair's GDC talk. The translator is further poisoning the well. Other reposts shared longer clips, but put a screenshot on top of the video of the dictionary definition of extortion. Again, poisoning the well by priming the viewer to expect the very worst in the following video. There are more examples of this clip being used, of course, but what really sealed the deal was when streamers and YouTubers started amplifying those clips and the narratives attached to them. Some of these creators aren't really driven by ideology, but run with a story with no further research for the juicy drama money. Such as a professional YouTube video impressions thief, Asmon Gold. As reported by Grums here, only a few months ago, she falsely accused someone else of being a transphobe, which ended up being her banner on Twitter, a quote saying, Gina Carano responds to Kotaku senior editor that claimed she was a transphobe, and in quotes, the person who posted this is hot. I is Others fostered a specific kind of audience who are especially receptive to anti-woke messaging which is most definitely the case for It's a Gundam and The Quartering. Here's Kim Belair, CEO of Sweet Baby Inc., explaining the origin of how she felt about representation in games. Once you hear this, the reasoning behind some weird writing decisions in their games will suddenly click. I made a black female character for myself in Mass Effect 2, and it felt really really good i was like oh i can just do this pretty much in one of the first playable areas um you have your first fully customized player character shepherd um and you enter a space station and you have to rendezvous with someone named jacob taylor and randall lawson um but you meet jacob first the representation as joy she's a black anita sarkeesian the quarterings content is stupefying it, it's it's just interesting how poorly researched it actually is Every video of his is a scroll through Twitter and reading an article or two, of which typically none challenges views on a subject. And meanwhile, he adamantly exclaims how he is tired of politics infesting his games, being seemingly oblivious to his own distinctly political attitudes towards entertainment media, especially when it comes to the prospect of members of the opposite sex crawling into his sports games. In his own words, Middle grounds can be found, but a women's league in his sports game is crossing the line. You know, that's one thing that I think often gets misrepresented when people complain about, you know, wokeness and this, that, or the other thing. Mark, you mentioned, you know, and I mentioned too, the hypersensitivity thing. I fully admit that I, given what I do for a living, can fall victim to that. Like sometimes I'm like, oh, here we go. And I'm not willing to give something a chance because i've just been so like ground into a fine dust by this constant attack of politics i agree that there is a middle ground let me give you an example of what is not the middle ground a normie sports game american baseball mlb 20 whatever and i've always said this to my viewers too you don't have to fight every fight if you like something and it's got you know oh they donate money to this or that okay fine you don't have to fight every single fight but anyway they roll out i had pre-ordered the game the day before it comes out i think it came out today or it can't whatever it comes out very soon i come across my twitter we're introducing uh a all women's franchise mode and this i'm like no like come on I'm like all right well cancel my pre-order but life goes on, I suppose. You know, it's very easy to just say, just because if I if I still give them my money, then they're going to continue to do crap like that. And so maybe some sacrifices are worth it. Is there, you know, is there some um, the big big is wait big island patriots says there is no middle ground with these leftists. Unfortunately, you're probably right about that. Um, yeah, it, 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 it's... Gaming has to be purged. What is especially, excuse my French, retarded when it comes to the prospect of politics and games being bad or them infesting experiences all of a sudden in order to influence the audiences is that every facet of the human experience is intertwined with the things we create and consume. A game without politics is seen relatively often. 
but I would argue that political, societally critical and ideological game experiences are a dime a dozen, and many of which are beloved by audiences. Experiences such as Bioshock or Disco Elysium have blatant political messaging, while experiences like Fallout New Vegas or Sid Meier's Civilization V could be considered ideological and political sandboxes. In both of the latter examples, the player can even directly explore what autocracy and rampant militarism really looks like in action. Many past games go balls deep into exploring ideology and politics. Hell, what faction is best for the Mojave is debated amongst Fallout fans to this day. And many boycotters, including the leader, Kabutos, have played games like Fallout in Vegas before. By the way, the game is filled to the brim with homosexuals and with women who hold some form of power in the world. Don't tell Mr. Quartering. No! Really, a game that features an option to set the player's pronouns to they, or a game that features women's leagues alongside the more popular men's leagues and sports, are far less egregious examples of rampant political exploration or influence in a game when compared to games such as the Fallout series, which explores themes as heavy as mass extermination, subjugation, or the pseudoscientific concept of race and racial purity. And so much more. Your ride's over, Muty. Time to die. Politics or ideology aren't the problem here. It's the politics or ideology which the Quartering and his followers disagree with, which allows them to blow any messaging they don't like out of proportion, which they otherwise likely wouldn't if they consumed the media they found interesting without influencers whispering into their ears how woke those games supposedly are. This mindset facilitates a witch hunt the likes of which we are observing at this instant, as guilt by association thrives with such a poorly thought out ideology. It doesn't even matter if SBI even worked on the story or not. They are woke, so they just have to go broke. A common comparison across videos from multiple influencers is one to feminist frequency, or more specifically, Anita Sarkeesian. She's a black Anita Sarkeesian. The other YouTuber I really wanted to put on the spotlight, It's a Gundam, titled Sweet Baby Incorporated, the successful feminist frequency. And he, in my opinion, did far more disgusting things in order to misrepresent Sweet Baby Inc. Unlike the quartering, It's a Gundam sought out the presentations Kim Belair held and made it seem like he watched through them, pretending to provide some form of valuable commentary on the subject, cherry-picking clips to misrepresent his ideological enemy and strawman essentially everything Kim Belair said. In this clip, she plugs her GDC representation panel from 2022. So, I checked it out. Obviously, comments and likes are disabled. Notice a the theme. And I'm the co-founder of a little narrative development company called uh, Sweet Baby Inc. We do narrative development in games and kind of beyond, and we try to... And I would put myself into a lot of art, into a lot of narratives, and I put my family and people who look like me in all of these cool scenarios, and I was telling all these stories where I got to see myself, I got to see people who look like me, and... To say that this was boring is an understatement. It is a 29 minute video of self-congratulatory wank fest where she proceeds to break her own neck to lick her own lady bits. Remember, it's a Gundam admitted to this. By this time, people finally caught on to Kim Valera's 2019 CGC panel that I showed my first video 10 days ago. I skipped the rest of this video as soon as she went into her trademark rant about Catcher in the Rye. No matter what she says, the worst possible interpretation one could think up is extrapolated from what Kim said. Take the story of how the company found its name, for instance. Sweet Baby Inc. Uh, is actually derived from the fact that we worked with a lot of different teams in, in previous times. And every time we worked with someone who we really vibed with or we really felt like, okay, this is really, really going well, we would go like, wow, they were such sweet babies. And when we started Sweet Baby, we said, we only want to work with sweet babies and we only want to work with sweet babies that origin story for the name totally makes sense with the way this company is a whole bunch of hug box adults 
able to just spread their progressive toxin into games and make them even lamer than they already are. This is, this is just the worst possible interpretation you could take on after listening to what Kim Belair actually said. The company's name, Sweet Baby Inc., uh, is actually derived from the fact that we worked with a lot of different teams in, in previous times. And every time we worked with someone who we really vibed with or we really felt like, okay, this is really, really going well, we would go like, wow, they were such sweet babies. And when we started Sweet Baby, we said we only want to work with sweet babies. And obviously that's something that is always going to be a challenge, always going to be a changing and an evolving thing. But to me, it's an ethos that really is important, which is we want to work with people who care about people and care about what they're doing. And remember that the art is, is more important than the product, but the product can never be more important than the people. And I think that that's, that's a core of our beliefs. And It's a Gundam concludes that Sweet Baby condescends to their collaborators and only wants to work with people they can easily manipulate, when in reality, the company's name and Kim Belair's intention of only working with Sweet Babies is meant in the most endearing way imaginable. Additionally, in an interview with Inclusion FX, Kim elaborates on what kind of people she loves to work with, even putting the people on the top of the list of priorities, much rather having an okay project to work on with an exceptional team instead of working on a phenomenal game, but with a horrible set of collaborators. I think to protect myself and for my own mental health, I have made sure that I work with people I really, really care about and really, really respect and really, really enjoy working with. I often talk about the fact that like video games are such huge projects, right? And they feel like they're these huge works of creative brilliance and, and they take so many brains. But for me, I would much rather work on something that is an okay project with great people who I care about, who lift each other up, who provide like a sense of balance than something that is, you know, maybe technically very proficient, but it was hell to make and the people aren't empathetic. So for me, I, I make sure that, you know, the work feels good, that we're always being kind to each other, that I'm always having fun and that I can at least laugh a little bit every day. It's a Gundam also repeatedly dissuades his audience from informing themselves on the matter and watching through Kim Belair's presentations by labeling these talks as an origin story no one asked for or the GDC talk being boring and self-aggrandizing while not having watched the full presentations himself. On top of this, he showcased multiple snippets from the talks showcased in this video and always assumes the worst in regards to what Kim could mean with what she says. And he completely skips over statements in his coverage that he likely would agree with. This person, like many other people at this moment, is not covering the subject in good faith. What doesn't help either is that his messaging on what SBI actually do or how much influence they actually have is just as inaccurate as what a majority of influencers parrot regarding the subject, further implying that SBI is the bringer of all evil. Even before then, we have been subjected to the machinations of Sweet Baby. We just didn't know it at the time. For instance, they were part of the God of War sequel, obviously the God of War 2, which explains why Anger Boda, the frost giant, was randomly black and Kratos had a lot more dad energy. As a man who took great interest in Norse mythology, I found this move to be beyond the pale in terms of stupidity. It's like, you know, when they made Marie Antoinette black on Netflix, it just doesn't make any sense. Sweet Baby was also involved in the making of Spider-Man 2. It was probably one of their bigger IPs they got a hold of in recent years. While playing the game, I found the dialogue to be laughably bad at times and cringe-inducing at others. Mysterio having a DJ mission for Miles Morales, because that wasn't racist at all. Mary Jane with her giant chin and her John Wick mission simulator that the director defended. If this video couldn't convince you so far, don't worry, we've got more up our sleeves. While we recommend you to watch the presentation in full, we no, you're likely not going to do that. So we're going to show you some clips from the GDC talk that these culture war grifters didn't talk about. And when we do, you'll quickly see why. 
trying to listen past some of the words she used or metaphors employed, and actually concentrate on what Kim is talking about. What you may see when conducting this little experiment is that what Kim is presenting and talking about actually is fairly reasonable, and you may even find yourself agreeing to some of the ideas proposed. Let's start with what Kim thinks about the dreaded cis white males. She has been characterized as a racist, hating white men in particular and talking down to them, viewing them as nothing more than insolent children, when in reality, Kim was talking about the publisher's view on what the target demographic of a game wants and thinks like, while advocating for the average white guy's intelligence and readiness to explore new perspectives. We start treating our core demographics as a fixed and static value, something that does not want to change and something that is locked in place. So despite like the changing face of audiences, despite the changing face of conferences like this one, we still look at our core demographics and say, okay, they're white, cis, hetero, males. And we cater almost exclusively to them. And the problem is that we don't just cater to them like, you know, here, here's something that we think you'll enjoy. We cater to them the way that we cater to like a picky baby. We feed them the same thing that we know that they love and we keep on feeding it. We're like, here you go, you love it. Eat this, eat this, eat this. So that then when they get anything else, they react as a picky baby would, which is be like, oh no, thank you. I do not want this. And we've actually done this so long that what we're doing is creating an entire nation of picky babies. And they make us scared to deviate from what we actually want to do. Just in case these picky babies don't want to play our games. And we've made a lot of progress. Obviously, like I don't say this to just completely go like, just give up, we've, <laughs> we've screwed it. Um, but I think it's still amazing that I can be seated in a meeting and told that out of 12 characters, we already have one black one, so there can't possibly be a second. But I do like to imagine that when we look at uh, white guys, and there's several of you here, um, I think that when we look at you, we say, okay, you can't possibly enjoy this. But I think they want also, and maybe you want also, to experience new and different stories. I think we need to step out of this rule that like white men can enjoy fantasy worlds, aliens, sci-fi, monsters, anything, so long as it's through a lens that looks exactly like them. Because if that's the kind of person that we're always gonna to cater to, you're never going to innovate. You're never going to change things. You're just gonna keep feeding the picky baby. And we cannot continue to try to create art under a system that is going to bar innovation for fear of a picky baby throwing a tantrum. She argued this by pointing to the fact that she had related to numerous protagonists that were white men. If she as a woman of color could do that, why could a white person not relate to the stories of people from other cultural backgrounds? And I really don't think that it's impossible to change this because as like a woman of color, I have played with and like empathized with a lot of white men. I have played as Kratos, who's like literally white. I've played as Nathan Drake. I've played as Arthur Morgan and I've loved it. And I don't think it's like pie in the sky thinking to go like, hey, maybe we can invite white dudes to play as other people and experience different things through someone else's eyes. And if they don't like it, we have to start thinking we're not losing, they're losing, and we're losing because we're gonna let them stand in the way of our progress and our innovation. And I think that we need to stop thinking that our like core marketing demographics have to define the exact demographics of our playable characters and of our cast. And instead, we start to have to assume that players do want new stories, and that if we bring joy to our broad audience, it's going to encompass our core audience as well. That's where the inclusion in diversity and inclusion comes in. In the mind of a person like Kim, these sorts of stories are not designed to kick white people or men out of the club. They're designed to broaden the club's membership. This might be a good time to point out that the COO of the company, David Bedard, happens to be a white man. A big contributor to the besmirchment of Sweet Baby as a company is the idea that Sweet Baby shoehorns minorities into any game they touch, ruining them in the process. Since many detractors claim to advocate for a far more sensible inclusion of diversity. But here we can see that Kim's ideas of diversity might be the more sensible ones. To give you an idea of what the diversity and inclusion Kim promotes actually looks like, we can bring up an example she introduced in her GDC talk. 
And so recently I was consulting on a project that was a dating simulator. And I was faced with like a very simple decision point that the writers were trying to achieve. When being asked to consult on a dating simulator, a scene they were working on was the protagonist being asked by their date what their ex was like. Which is a bit much for a first date. <laughs> with essentially three options. They were nice, but it didn't work out. I don't really want to talk about it. And my ex was a monster. These would cause positive, neutral, or negative reactions, respectively. With the my ex was a monster option, causing the date to react with disgust, calling the character immature. What they wanted to do was just have a very simple question where if you respond, your ex can, or your date can say, I like that, or I don't like that, or kind of be neutral about it. But I played through that and I realized something that they hadn't really seen, and it's that this question was deeply gendered, despite the fact that they didn't even intend that. Kim suggested that this line, although designed for a protagonist that could be a man or a woman, was one tied to gender stereotypes, reminding her of the image of a man having to deal with a crazy ex-girlfriend, a stereotype often played off for laughs. Kim noted that for a woman, the more likely meaning of a saying like this would be a serious recounting of abuse. You know what though, don't worry about it. We can create a condition for this because if you respond to that person by saying, hey, my ex was a monster, what if she digs a little deeper? She suggested that instead of the date just reacting negatively to the response, it would be more interesting if the date probed further, asking the protagonist if they meant it seriously or if it was just a joke. Imagining a heart-to-heart -heart moment where a woman who had gone through such an experience could see herself in the character. Because I think that even though, you know, this game is light, it would be a genuinely important moment to be able to express that sentiment in a game. Although, this suggestion from Kim comes from a desire to make women's experiences more accounted for, it could add nuance across the board. For example, imagine this version of the conversation as the male protagonist. He's on a date and the date asks him about his ex. He calls her a monster. And when Probed says he's serious, that he's talking about some kind of genuine abuse or trauma that he went through, that could shine a light on an instance of a woman abusing a man in a relationship, which is something that a lot of the time isn't really touched on. Be honest, if you think of a straight relationship that involves abuse, you would probably jump to the man being the abuser. This more nuanced conversation could show that these sorts of things are human experiences. There's no box for victim and abuser that one gender just fits in and the other doesn't. And it could also be an interesting case of character development. Relaying this negative experience with an ex could either piss off your date when making a stupid joke, or, if you were serious, have them become more empathetic towards you. Now compare that to the original version of the dialogue, where you playing as a man might sincerely pick that answer, only to have a woman brush you off and sensitively, holding it against you for bringing up a bad experience. Which of these versions sounds more reasonable when you put it like that? We would say that it sounds like quite a reasonable suggestion for a change. But that's not what the company Kim was consulting decided to do. What happened instead? The writing team was like, okay, thank you for this insight. And then they just like took it away. <laughs> they got nervous and I think that is the problem that we face when we think of representation as a challenge that we just need to like surmount. We could just like go, oh, nope, solved, we did it. Because we took it away and we don't have to face it anymore. But I thought here, this was an opportunity for innovation. Here we had the chance to make a woman who has been victimized see herself in a game, be able to express something to another woman in the game, and kind of actually relate to it. And we had that opportunity, but instead we pulled back because we thought it was safer not to push forward. And after the whole thing was done, the team thanked me again, and they said, like, thanks so much, you really mitigated the risk. So, contrary to the stereotype of the permanently offended SJW, who just wants to censor media, Kim was actually frustrated that the approach she encountered was just cut. 
a segment that appeared to be problematic. As a narrative designer, she wanted to make characters more interesting, and her ideas were about having more complex characters that didn't just conform to easy archetypes. Doing that by improving, rather than removing, story elements. Put simply, the real world is a nuanced place. People are complex and don't just fit into easy boxes. And representing that is something she was interested in doing. Way too much. And I once worked on a project where they had an all-white cast and they expressed their desire like, okay, we need to mix it up a bit. How about this character is kind of like stereotypically French? So they have a beret and they have like a striped shirt. And I was like, okay, if you need to do that, can we at least make them a person of color? And they said, oh no, that would be weird. They're already French. So I want to do better than this. The stumbling block here is that while the company might prefer to be making positive suggestions about what to add, rather than negative suggestions about what to remove, the companies that they work for will have the final say. This means that SBI has to shoulder the risk of judgment on the projects they contribute to but they don't have the creative control to balance that out. As a company filled with mouths that need feeding, this less than ideal relationship is one sweet baby has to put up with. They cannot afford to pass up contracts with a company just because their ideas won't always be taken on board. Another example she pointed to for this was Mass Effect, which she mentioned was the first time she had made a black character in a game with character customization. Imagine me now as a player, because this is my go-to example and it's something that like, I talk about all the time and it's the first time that I ever made a black character in a video game. And this is genuinely embarrassing to relate to a crowd of people, but for a really long time before this, when I was offered like a character customization screen, I was like, well, I can't put myself in there because that, that's weird and not what video games are. And so I like made some like stubbly white dude protagonists, <laughs> even when I had like every option available to me because I didn't want to feel like I was putting too much of myself into this world where I didn't belong. And it's wild to think about, like I just created Nathan Drake and so was like, go, explore every game. Um, but anyway, the first time that I actually made a black protagonist was in Mass Effect in 2010. And that felt really, really great. She was excited by the introduction to the game, where her black commander Shepard was introduced to the marine Jacob Taylor. What she was excited by was the fact that Taylor didn't fit into some box of what a black character should be. And neither did Shepard. Basically, your fully customized Commander Shepard has to enter a space station and rendezvous with um, two characters, Jacob Taylor and Miranda Lawson. But you meet Jacob first. And for those of you who don't know, Jacob is a black man. He's a Marine. And he's your first kind of like point of contact. So your first interaction with him, you're like crouching behind cover and you're having like a close quarters conversation. And when this happened in the game, it was this really powerful and remarkable moment for me because it was two black characters talking one-on-one -on -one, and neither of them is cast as a criminal. They're not a sidekick, they're not a savage, they're not a stereotype, they're not a gang member. And they're the only two people on screen in this moment talking about something much greater than them. And it was just like really, really, really nice. This seems to be pretty much exactly what promoters of sensible diversity would be enthusiastic about too. Black characters who aren't there to promote some agenda. Their blackness isn't even relevant to the narrative. Their actual role is getting tangled up in the military and political intrigue of the game's world. Focusing on interesting characters as the goal, rather than vapid tokenism, is something she directly mentioned in the talk. But of course, if you were only shown very select, split-second clips out of context, that's an impression you would completely lose. With Belair being cast, as encouraging these stereotypes that she very clearly spoke against. Um, I think it's one thing in narrative, because honestly in narrative it's a little bit easier to implement because we have the power to go like, oh, we can build choices that consider you know, marginalized identities and just write them into our work. We can decide to tell stories that pre present like you know, very rare narratives and representative experiences. Um, and we can kind of work on detokenizing our minority characters. 
And so in that way, we do have like a lot of power to actually affect the change that we want to see and to work all of these concepts in our material as narrative developers. But we still work for people. And it's another kettle of fish, I think, when it comes to like the structures that approve these choices. And we have to kind of look at them a little more institutionally because we can write all the stories that we want, but that doesn't mean that anyone's going to buy them, anyone's going to market them, anyone's going to let us do it. In an interview with Kotaku, she specifically voiced annoyance that Sweet Baby was being misrepresented as a DEI company, a company dedicated solely to dealing with diversity issues, and that the team's accomplishments were being tied to their identities as part of marginalized groups rather than their skills as writers. This frustration with tokenism isn't just something exclusive to Belair. Another Sweet Baby affiliate, Neha Patel, posted about the anxiety the phenomenon causes, giving her a kind of imposter syndrome for all of her accomplishments, wondering if they're a product of recognition for genuine talent or just someone trying to tick a box for the sake of optics. And on the sentiment of adding to rather than subtracting from, this is something that COO David Bedal shares with Belair. Removing all of the offense or edge from an experience comes to a detriment to the experience. And David even spelled it out directly by describing an inoffensive experience as kind of boring. Uh, so, so that it's not looking at a list of red flags of like, oh, make sure you don't offend this and, 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 and do this badly. It's more, okay, this is what you could be doing if you leaned into this identity, if you leaned into this uh, to this inspiration. Like I said before, we try to be additive in our approach. So we don't show up to a project and say, hey, these are all the problems. You're gonna mess up if you do all these things this way. What that ends up doing is oftentimes that we'll sand it down and make something inoffensive and oftentimes honestly kind of boring. Uh, and, and kind of like uh, too smooth. And so instead we try to put a, we try to go about it from an additive perspective where uh, we want to bring joy to the player. These just don't read as words from some kind of loony out of touch, pink or blue haired leftists. They come off as the words of people who want to be seen as people and tell stories of characters that go beyond that box to be checked. A common thread that Sweet Baby critics follow is the genuine and unadulterated disinterest they harbor in anything their victim actually talks about, completely missing out on much common ground that the narrative design company and upset gamers could share. After watching hours worth of videos, reading various tweets and articles, we could discern that these values Sweet Baby Inc. is criticized for violating, they in fact stand for. Only that tragically, no one is willing or capable of listening. Now, it does have to be said that the company really doesn't help themselves sometimes. Despite Belair criticizing the reductionary approaches of things like sensitivity reading, it is a service they mention front and center on their website. You could be forgiven for misunderstanding their role as purely dedicated to DEI issues at first, rather than the whole spectrum of narrative design. And a lot of the company's detractors evidently did make that mistake. Language is another divisor that is very important to be aware of as ideologues perk up instantly when they get to hear certain words. For people that push their conservative agenda, or ones that reciprocate it, hearing talk of cisgender white males, or, I don't know, representation, diversity, or more specific terms such as microaggression, makes them jump to conclusions fast. In her talk, Kim used all of them. These factors result in a terminal optics problem that conservatives pounce on, presenting ideas that are often fairly reasonable as absolutely insane, an issue that progressives seemingly can't shake. In fairness, this was a talk Kim gave to a group of mostly like-minded game developers, not something she expected to be blasted out of context to a far broader audience. And when you focus on what she actually has to say, rather than picking over certain terms, 
you can see that she was actually a very clear and insightful speaker. The fact that her detractors had to grab the tiniest snippets possible to misrepresent her shows exactly that. What's up everyone? Thank you for watching this video. If you're enjoying it and you like like deep dives like this one with you know some semblance of production quality behind it, then check out my Patreon down below. You can also find other avenues of support. You can check out our website, The Entropic Domain, and read more on this subject. And well, you could also check out another video. But yeah, thank you for watching, share it around, and I hope I see you in the comments. During my research on the Sweet Baby controversy, a friend of the channel was quite interested about writing on the subject too. And I thought there would be no better way to include his thoughts on the matter than an opinion column closing out the video, presenting my guest perspective on the topic, and then closing out with my own thoughts on the matter. Welcoming Parallax. There's a reason why this story about Sweet Baby Inc. blew up the way it did. We live in an age where short, bite-sized content is ubiquitous on the internet. Distilling content into this form factor is convenient for many of us, especially if you're a student or a working professional, like me. But because of how gratifying and easy it is to consume content at such breakneck speed, we quickly find ourselves engrossed in consuming more and more of it for hours on end. As a result, many of us suffer from information overload and, in turn, have shorter attention spans. Anything that doesn't immediately catch our attention or provide us with an instant dopamine hit will get lost in the noise. A nightmare for journalists and internet influencers alike trying to make a living from their work. This quandary led many of them down a dark path of obsessing with min-maxing the bare minimum of what would get the most clicks to their content. Eventually, they figured out that the best way to attract massive traffic to one's own platform was by manufacturing outrage. Gamer! Today I want to talk about the Sweet Baby Inc. disaster. This organization has been able to profit off some of the worst games you've ever seen. Every single one of them has had major issues and faced major criticism. It seems like their end goal isn't really just diversifying games. No, their end goal is more arguably trying to coerce game studios into using consultation services and generating profit through that method. Sweet Baby Inc. isn't the only company that received undue flack from reactionaries with an axe to grind, with equally reactionary journalists and internet influencers cheering them on. We keep hearing outrageous stories every week from these same journalists and internet influencers, peddling the idea that someone or something is conspiring to distort and destroy everything people love by making it woke, black robes and all.
If you're like me, you've probably noticed this obsession within the video game industry to constantly inject political messaging and ideologies into the franchises we know and love for no real reason other than to score ESG points across the board, and you've probably also noticed that pretty much every AAA gaming franchise and studio has been going downhill dramatically when it comes to the quality of games, the storytelling, and narratives within those games, and overall video games as a whole have just been getting worse and worse as the years progress. Now, given the sensitive nature of this topic and the fact that the previous video I so much as mentioned this organization that we're going to be talking about in got age restricted last time, I decided not only to script this video for the sake of my channel, but also to demonstrate whether or not this organization has such close ties with the tech industry where they can actually influence a company like YouTube or other social media platforms to suppress any mention or criticism of them. So it's going to kind of serve as a dual purpose to inform you guys about this particular organization as well as kind of test the waters to see what is and is not off limits so in this particular instance I normally don't ask for this up front but if you guys could drop a like on this video it's gonna help it out in the algorithm because again I don't know to which degree YouTube is gonna try and suppress this so a like would go a long way to make sure that people can actually see this video which you know would be nice the audiences were told to resist and fight against political correctness found oh so abundantly in modern media a disease spread around by crazy corpo show ideologues forcing their agenda onto others. Also, there's a lot of people on Twitter defending Sweet Baby Inc. Like this tweet saying, uh, you got to admit that you're weird with this Sweet Baby stuff because they're pointing out the games they're working on. Uh, again, I think you're weird if you're someone in a hobby like this and you don't care about these things. You let people walk all over your hobby and you're just going to sit there and take it. No, if you voice your concerns and track the bad actors in your hobby, I think you're doing the right thing. And obviously the impact is getting to Sweet Baby Inc. who is scrambling right now to delete inflammatory posts made by their employees. And it's just making it even more obvious that there is a very big PR nightmare going on over there. And they're aware that the mask is slipping and people are starting to understand the full scope of the scene and all of the issues going on here, which is many in the video game industry and the impact that Sweet Baby Inc., its members, its supporters, that they're having on the gaming industry. People now know an identifiable source of a lot of the problems that gamers have been dealing with for years now, which really could stem back all the way to the original Gamergate and the pattern is very obvious and the players are becoming more and more known. Sometimes if they feel like it, they will cite articles or tweets to support their claims, showing everyone the sheer severity of the problem at hand. So sweet baby, you know what they are, right? Ever wonder how they manage to enforce so much diversity, equity and inclusion into video games? Here, I'll even show you a video. Here's a clip of Kim Belair, who is one of the co-founders of Sweet Baby, who said during a conference how Sweet Baby manages to get their way when it comes to including all the nonsense that they do. Let's watch that now, shall we? Um, if you're a creative working in AAA, which I did for many, many years, um, put this stuff up to your higher-ups. And if they don't see the value in what you're asking for, when you ask for consultants, when you ask for research, go have a coffee with your marketing team and just terrify them with the possibility of what's going to happen if they don't give you what you want. As you can see, as plain as day, you have Kim Belair, the person who controls Sweet Baby, saying out loud at the Game Developer Conference, mind you of all places, that she admits to using intimidation, fear, and threats in order to get what she wants when it comes to including woke nonsense into video games. How is this not being reported on? Well, we know why, of course, don't we? So you've now seen the leader of Sweet Baby admitting that they use coercion tactics to ensure their political messaging makes its way into the games that you buy. And it's obviously based on her words here that she has been met with resistance in the past. But don't worry, all it takes is a single coffee at a Starbucks to tell these marketing teams that, hey, if you don't do what I want to a T, I'll use my power to label your entire studio as racist. Then I'll use my power to ensure you don't get job opportunities within this industry ever again if you decide to deny me access to your franchises so that I can force my beliefs and politics into them. How the hell are these websites ignoring this? It's right there. You can see it. You can hear it. It's right there in front of you. All the proof you need that they are destroying video games for their own personal gain. But, more often than not, 
I have found that whenever the topic of political correctness gets brought up by reactionaries, they mostly talk about、uh, the inclusion of minorities in video games, more accessibility options for players, female characters not pretty, busty, and curvy anymore, male protagonists being portrayed as effeminate and weak. Female characters having too much muscle and、uh, fucking pronouns as proof that corporations are conspiring against normal people like them. I can't stress this point enough. These were all farcical controversies that are not only inconsequential in the grand scheme of things, but it contributed very little value to the discussion of the current state of gaming today. Take forced diversity, for example. Why does this point get brought up every time black characters are introduced in video games? If bad writing is their main gripe against the forced inclusion of black characters in video games, they should know that bad writing can happen in any game regardless of the character's skin color. If the writing is bad, the story will be bad, and no amount of J.C. Dentons and the postal dudes in the game will fix that for them. Contrary to what these reactionaries would like you to believe. Good writing can exist independently from the pawns driving the narrative of the story forward, and all this bitching about forced diversity is just a roundabout way of saying that they've simply paid for bad games. But these reactionary journalists and internet influencers don't seem to care about these nuances. Most of them only concern themselves with chasing clout and the almighty dollar. Which could explain why they can't stop talking about culture wars on their respective platforms. It doesn't matter if the things they said are based on flimsy evidence, unsubstantiated rumors, or worse, making shit up. Nor do they care if they've driven multiple innocent people off the internet in the name of accountability. They will do everything in their power to keep this cycle of outrage going, and they do this. By conditioning their communities to be in a perpetual state of outrage, feeding into their learned habit of only finding relief in their favorite YouTubers, validating their fears and concerns. It also didn't help that some of the more well-meaning journalists and YouTubers that they also followed did not properly research some of the topics they covered. The story of Sweet Baby Inc. happens to be one of them. In this case, these journalists and YouTubers ended up echoing the same disinformation perpetuated by reactionaries to their audiences, lending credence to the lies that the latter worked so hard to sell, and entrenching their audiences deeper into the siege mentality against the wokes and the progressives for longer. Ivan Pavlov would be proud. One of the things these reactionaries have instilled in the minds of many is the idea that if others enjoy games as they do, it compromises the things they already have. But that's not true, especially in the case of Sweet Baby Inc. It's clear at this point that Kim Belair wasn't going around censoring video games, visiting their offices, and pointing a firearm to their heads to impose her woke politics. In fact, she wants to flesh out the problematic parts of the characters and their stories more, making them complex and interesting for a change. Unfortunately, many of her ideas get shot down by some gaming companies that only care about making the safest, inoffensive slop imaginable to appease their money-hungry shareholders. In doing so, it makes the narrative of the games they've made so predictable, vapid, and boring. For that, I respect Kim for putting in the effort to remedy this issue, and I think a lot of people can find plenty of common ground with her had they listened to what she said in full. It's a shame. It's a shame that, as far as I can tell, a lot of people had already internalized this misguided belief that Kim Belair is just another irrational wokerati activist and. Whatever that comes out of her mouth can no longer be trusted. But it doesn't have to be this way. Reactionaries live and thrive off of negativity by galvanizing anger and hate toward their made-up boogeymen every day of the week. The point is not to be right. Being right means you need to know the facts, learn the reasons for what 
and why things happen, and then defend your position using those facts and reasons when challenged. But all they can do is lie and misrepresent the facts on the table, something we have been made painfully aware of the second these reactionaries took this out-of-context clip of Kim Belair's speech to rile everyone up for their own self-interest. Some of you watching this video may disagree with everything I have to say. And that's okay. But if there's one thing I wanted you to take away from all of this, it is that you are your own person. You have the agency to think for yourselves, to deduce whether the information presented is credible or not. You don't need these reactionaries telling you what to believe and how to react to what's happening around you. I don't blame you for harboring anger and resentment towards those who tried to ruin your hobby, believing their every word. Hell, I used to be that way too. I was being led around by the nose by these reactionaries, some of whom are featured in this video you're watching right now. I harassed people, people who I was told were horrible and did terrible things toward others who got in their way of pushing their political agenda. Of course they insisted that they've never created or encouraged a harassment campaign towards anyone they've made videos on. After all, all they did was report on the news and shed light on what was going on by dramatizing and exaggerating events that unfolded and painted the person worse than they really are, almost like they were trying to push people to feel and act a certain way. I thought I was doing the right thing. After all, a sizable portion of the fan base I used to be a part of was doing it too. When these reactionaries made videos denigrating multiple women who called out this one prominent voice actor for being a sex pest all those years ago, I joined in with the rest of the mob, jeering them for being insane feminists, for trying to bring down an honest man out of jealousy. It wasn't until later that I realized this honest man I defended so fervently is a certified sex pest, like they say he is, with all the evidence laid bare in front of my eyes. His name is Vic Mignogna, and in case you're wondering, he recently lost his appeal for the third time in his defamation case against Funimation, Monica Rial, Jamie Markey, and Ron Toyer in December of 2022. This is why I'm very passionate about discussing these reactionary grifters in the first place. For lack of a better term, they fucked us all over. And I'm not letting them have their way with what they're doing with the recent Sweet Baby Ink fiasco right now. The ones who ruined our hobbies are not people like Kim Belair and David Badar. It's the gaming corporations. They're the ones responsible for the massive layoffs in gaming companies for the past few years, exploiting the remaining developers by overworking them up to 70 hours per week over the course of several months, often uncompensated, to meet unreasonable deadlines. This crunch culture got so bad that a lot of game developers suffer sleep deprivation, depression, anxiety, and heart complications, among many others. Gaming corporations are also the ones who shamelessly introduce predatory microtransactions and live services into their games, and yet, they have the audacity to hike the prices of their base games to 70 US dollars and call it a quadruple A game because they're beholden to the shareholders that only cared whether they can make the line go up. All of this while their board executives get paid top dollar doing absolutely nothing about the sexual harassment cases under their watch. Have you ever wondered why you have heard so little about these issues until now? It's because we've been constantly bombarded with, yet again, pointless culture war topics by the likes of Asmund Gold, The Quartering, It's a Gundam, Discount Store Linguini, Griffin Gaming, and more. Every time they do this, they always distract us from focusing our discontent on the corporations for the reasons mentioned earlier, opting instead to tackle trite topics such as pronouns and trans people. This is all by design. They don't have the slightest interest in seeing the horrid conditions within the gaming industry today improve because then they would have nothing to complain about. 
it's easier to just attribute the quality degradation of games to woke politics, because manufacturing fake outrage always sells. That is the reality we live in. And I'm afraid it's going to stay this way for years to come. Hello? We need to talk. Ah, this is great too. We've got Parallax responding to Cap 4, the dude, the Collins dude or whatever, who was calling you all Nazis. Uh, Parallax apparently agrees with that. That's a that's a wonderful take, Parallax. Yes, falsely accuse a bunch of people that include Jewish people and LGBT people of being such. That's a great look. Good job. What happens now? Evidently, the boycott will continue to rage on and people will continue fighting an enemy they don't even understand. We tried doing our part. Hell, I sent emails or direct messages to over a dozen contacts, including almost every company that worked with Sweet Baby Inc. Various individuals working at those companies, Sweet Baby Inc. themselves, the leader of the boycott Cabrutos, etc, etc, in the hopes that we could gain the ultimate behind-the-scenes view on the subject and play the interview clips against each other in order to make the most thorough video on the subject that we wished already existed. This ideal scenario evidently didn't happen. And mind you, everyone rejected us or didn't get back to us, so this is not some weird, like, conspiracy thing, okay? Cabrutus politely rejected us, and we didn't hear back from anyone else, and I can't really blame anyone. Cabrutus is swamped with interview requests at this moment, and is kickstarting his streaming career. While one moderator of a development studio I contacted gave me a rundown on why the studio wasn't interested in talking to me. There was a fear in a potential interview only digging a deeper trench, which given the current happenings, is a fear I harbor myself. We already see new narratives come out of nowhere, with more interviews with an articles being misrepresented. Tim Belair has launched another cancel campaign against Cabrutus Rambo. Sweet Baby seemingly are not able to catch a break. I am a bit disappointed in not landing any interviews, but hey, to the people I contacted, my offer still stands. We all love video games. We are very passionate about them. And I would personally say that the video game medium, when handled correctly, stands at the peak of entertainment media as a whole. With a really good game being able to make us laugh, bring us to tears, or influence us in much deeper ways. Such as aspiring to learn new languages, help reform our beliefs, or bring us to try out new things we saw in games. Just how many people got into skateboarding because of Skate 3? How many people became history buffs thanks to games such as Mountain Blade or the Civilization series? We all understand how much of an influence games are on our lives, and we wouldn't want someone to ruin this medium for us. However, it is important to be mindful of what you are really combating and what the end result of your actions will be, irrespective of the intended outcome. Pantov says, do you really believe that you are effectively fighting DEI companies and leftward political pressure in the medium by instrumenting half-truths, lying through omission, and guilt by association tactics? Do you think you best fight what you believe to be ideological extremists by accepting the help from ideological extremists on the opposite end of the pendulum swing. What good can come out of what people call a culture war when a vast majority of the horde, including the president, generals and lieutenants up the chain of command, don't have a single fucking clue about what their enemy actually does? I understand the genesis of the boycott, the perceived entrudification of games, and the want to make things better than they are at this moment. But this is not the way to go. This is not the way to get what you want. 
And here is why. You are proving a stereotype right, which the likes of Kim Belair believe to not even exist in the first place. You are acting like the picky baby. Media is made by everyone, for everyone. And while I myself have experienced some games being a little too cringe inducing or parroting ideas I disagreed with, I either just kept playing or decided to not play the game anymore, depending on how severe the case really was. But oftentimes, when I played the game anyhow, it still provided me much enjoyment. Dude, I'm like 30 minutes, no, I'm like an hour into this and I still haven't done anything. Let's see. Wait, I have to prepare. Settings? Audio settings? <laughs> yes. Yes. <laughs> Let's fucking go. Life is Strange is such an example. That game really just didn't appeal to me, and almost everything about it was jarring in some way or form, but... Tell me! You are going to get in hella more trouble for this than... <laughs> Everything your punk ass, would they? Get that gun away from me, psycho! No! No! Shooting, shooting. I, I felt like the sound effect was leading. The gunshot was like a punchline. Whoa. What the fuck? I found enjoyment out of it. Even if unintended by the developers. Oh, no, this gets Kate. Let me guess. The... Oh, look, it's the end of the game. Oh, he actually came in with a gun. <coughs> <laughs> because you were holding a fucking weapon. David, watch out! Time and to suddenly the, the stats up. show up. <laughs> 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 Time to shut the fuck up, okay? Not to say that you should keep playing games that are annoying to you, but rather that some of the issues you may see in a game are really not that big of a deal. I mean, it's case specific, of course, but what really makes everything harder here, in terms of finding the actual line in the sand for many of your viewers, is that some donuts like Mr. Apolitical think women's leagues in sports is going too far already. No! Like, come on! I think far more important enemies to tackle are predatory monetization schemes, pre-order bonuses, games having five different flavors of deluxe editions, giant companies purchasing studios left right and center and then dissolving them due to embracing too many of them at once and multiplayer games that run on centralized server structures which if you think about it are just pointless to buy in the first place as they are just most definitely doomed to die gaming right now in many ways is cancer and outsourcing companies at least in my eyes are the least of our problems, especially when considering that third parties hold zero power over the entities that hired them in the first place. Would I make use of a company like Sweet Baby Inc? Not at all really. My videos such as this one are often collaborative pieces or written by myself entirely, and I believe that I know what is best for my own productions in the video realm. However, I wouldn't discount a service such as Sweet Babies here. Quite a few guys working there have much experience in the industry, and their consulting can lead to quite interesting insights which you yourself might not have considered in the first place. A lower budget version of what Sweet Baby does can also be done by consulting with friends or other peers you are close to. Hey, how is the audio balancing? You think this scene looks like shit? Is this sequence boring or Gucci? Consulting in itself isn't a problem. Don't want a service like that? Just don't ask for help then. But back to what this video really is about. The boycott. You might wonder why this production didn't heavily go into the journalist that wrote the Kotaku piece, the founder of Sweet Baby Inc. Detected, or the employees of Sweet Baby which instructed people to harass Cabrutos. The answer is, many of those tangential points would have completely distracted from what the message of this production really is. So, I will be addressing these things now. Chris Kindred unequivocally kicked the hornet's nest. If Chris didn't instruct people to report the SBI detective curator page, 
and to report Cabrutas' profile for good measure too, the Streisand effect would have been completely circumvented. Well, I, I mean, I just made a list. I mean, you guys probably know this, but I mean, at this point, everybody knows that I just made a list. And one of those, uh, one of FBI employees, mm -hmm. he tried to create a harassment campaign against me to get my personal Steam profile down and also my uh, creator group down. So this is where things uh, really started to blow up. You know, like every, everything started to escalate so quickly. No one except for a small minority would have given much of a shit about SBI, and this entire charade wouldn't have escalated to this embarrassment that we call a culture war. People have a close eye on you, Chris, and Kindred, if you happen to watch this video right now, just shut up. Please, just shut up. People are on your ass right now, and now even Elon Musk is throwing shade towards the company you work for, for something you have said online. Just please zip it if you care about Sweet Baby. Please. Games magazines didn't holistically cover the story. While Sweet Baby Inc. are victims of a smear campaign predominantly due to the spread of misinformation, Thanks to loudmouth employees who thought it was a great idea to silence their detractors, the company itself was a bad, bad baby. No statements from the company denouncing the employees' actions were issued. Nor was anyone fired. Nor did outlets such as PC Gamer just call a harassment campaign a harassment campaign. This gave ideologues such as the quartering ample ammunition in order to spread their narrative far and wide. Then, idiots who are tangentially connected to Sweet Baby Inc., such as the Kotaku journalist, or the woman who only hires black people for her game, are distractions and not really proof of anything. But, who is your team? Validate has a team of mostly people mostly all people of color we have no white people on our team um i did that because i wanted to create a safe environment and i know the best way for an environment to be safe is to be around people who are just like me um and i'm not saying that white people in the industry are creating safe unsafe environments i'm not saying that that is not what i'm saying i am saying that sometimes it is hard to work with white people because they think that something made okay, but it was really a microaggression. And no one wants to deal with that while they're trying to make a game that they love. Their racist actions or statements ought to be called out. However, it's best to stay focused and not lump someone like Elisa Mercante together with someone like Kim Belair, who, as far as my research is concerned, never uttered a single racist statement. Race does not exist. The white man, the black man, or the yellow man technically don't exist, and we shouldn't play in the racial ballpark altogether, if at all possible, as the concept is rooted in falsehoods. Making an effort to hire anyone but people with white skin or implying that white-skinned people cannot be discriminated against are very different attitudes to what Kim Belair has advocated for thus far. Addressing and combating biases. Elisa Mercante and Daniel Lalanders said racist shit, but please consider carefully if their racist statements really correlate to Sweet Baby's leadership. And lastly, Cabrutos, you still don't even have a single shred of an idea of what you are fighting against. And I got really tired really fast listening to your interview with The Quartering when the whole song and dance about merely informing consumers came up. And if you want to see how evil this list is and all the, you know, all the <laughs> terrible things it says about people, all it is is a list of games that the company has worked on, the very same list that their own company would list on their website as a positive thing. Am I am, am I missing all the harassment that you've in this? I, I, oh, I think like I'm missing it. I want to show you guys something really, really evil. 
no um it's my statement that i made um inside the group itself what it says is guys i appreciate all the messages a friend of us i've been receiving i'm going to accept you all in due time it's just that right now there's so much stuff going on keep in mind that this is a group slash curator has the goal of letting people know about the games that Sweet Baby Inc. worked on. We are not in any means a group that's trying to kill SBI or convince people not to buy the game that they worked on. Everyone is free to buy any game, even if it's a game that SBI worked on. It's your decision. I mean, this is, I, I don't know if, I, this is basically a fan group, I would think. You know, all these people are big fans of Sweet Baby Inc. They want to know what they worked on. <laughs> Uh, if you want to buy it or not, it's totally your decision. I respect your decision. It's freedom of choice. You have this right. It's just a list. If you want to know, just to let people know this kind of stuff. Drop the bullshit. The curator page's only purpose is to dissuade anyone from buying SBI affiliated games. If the curator page really was informational in nature only, you would have tagged your curations as informational in the first place. However, I want to give credit where some credit is due. Kabrutos has been quite resilient to getting bought by his interviewers. When concluding the interview, the quartering tried to goad Kabrutos into accepting payments or Steam gifts from his fans, which Kabrutos aptly deflected. I don't know if you want to share, it's up to you if you want to share like your Steam name. Can people like send you like Steam gift cards and stuff like that if they want uh, to? I Actually, I mean, I would appreciate because games are so expensive in Here Brazil. Here we go, our, yeah. Let's do our, it. Cur our currency is like uh, 5 to 1 compared to the US dollar. So okay. it's a $70 game. It's literally 350 bucks for us here. And our minimal wage is like 1,200, 1,300. Okay. So it's a third of, of a minimal wage salary. Yeah, can, I mean, how it's... Can people send, how can people send you Steam stuff? How does that work? Uh, man, I don't like asking for stuff. You know, I'm not. I, I'm, I, you don't have to ask for stuff. I'm. I'm saying if people want to support you, that they that they can. Don't feel bad about it. Mm -hmm. um, look at you. See all these super chats that came in. I'm not giving that to you. So don't worry about it. You know. That's <laughs> the, so how can people send you? I like how can Jeremy's people. <laughs> yeah. Here's what I'm going to ask you to do, Caputus. Do you use like um, PayPal or something? No, no, man. I don't want to ask for money, bro. I'm doing this for the gaming community. I use okay. it, but I don't. I don't want to. I'm doing this for the okay. gaming community. Okay. Okay. All right. Um, will you take? All right. I'm gonna send you some money then, and uh, <laughs> you're gonna take it because I made money from you being on the show, so I can send you. That's that's <laughs> fair, no, right? Bro. It's not necessary. You're helping me with my YouTube channel. You are spreading the word. You are also yeah. helping me. You know, you don't don't have to send me money. I'll go subscribe to his YouTube channel then. Kabrutos also was on top of his community, locking Steam discussions when they were getting way too spicy, and after infiltrating the Discord server to see for myself how the interactions there were, I honestly observed the moderators being on top of their game when it came to cracking down on malicious behavior. And Kabrutos himself even posted an announcement pleading for everyone to cease the harassment of others. He may not have much of an idea about what Sweet Baby does, or that he attracted a less than favorable audience of people to his cause, but his heart seems to be in the right place. So there you go. All my cards are metaphorically laid out on the table. And I hope that if you decide to give a shit, to keep our views in mind. If there's anything to take away from this, I would personally say that you should maybe just Think for yourself, and try to engage with some of what people you don't like are saying. I think while a majority of boycotters still have no idea about what they're doing, I think the Steam Curator page has a right to exist. And naturally, if you don't like a company and want to skip out on certain games because said company was involved, then keep doing that. You have a right to express yourself and show your discontent. Just as someone like myself can point out that some of the anger is misdirected or based on misrepresentations. As Kim Belair said herself, if you are gonna come for anyone, at least come correct. Don't be loud and wrong. Myself, giving this bitch and I don't need no help. Elegant to the team, elegant to the team, and we go to the top and you see all that green. 
Thank you.